Welcome to the Starseed Fitness Podcast. So today I have Paul Howell on. And Paul Howell, you know, it really forced me to challenge my beliefs. Uh, one of the things he says is stop stretching. Stop trying to stretch away your injuries. It is hurting you more than helping you. So stop stretching. And this really caused me to pause when I've seen him say things like this because it challenged my own beliefs about what and what I do and what I recommend to other people. So I wanted to have him on and really talk about his ideas and his program he created, the Sling Method. Very interesting conversation. Uh, I just say go into it with an open mind that you know maybe the things that we've been taught about fitness are not accurate, and maybe he started to figure some things out through his own life experience. So uh, with that being said, enjoy the episode. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess we can hop into it. Um, yeah. So I'm really curious, just like even to start with, I guess, um, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so uh, my name is Paul Howell. I created the Sling Method uh, about seven years ago now. Um, it's been a, a work in progress. It's just been continually evolving and updating and creating and uh, getting better and better as I've been going along. So I think I'm on, I think I'm on the fifth version now, the fifth update of the uh, of the Runners Rehab and the Basic Eight. Um, so my background really, I started as a, as a personal trainer when I was 17, I was still at school, I was bored and I wanted to just do something different through the summer. So I did a, a personal training certification with WABA, the World Amateur Bodybuilding Association. And, uh, then I just kind of like everything kind of grew from there. Really. I, I was really interested in bodybuilding and powerlifting and, you know, personal training with people and. Uh, it kind of just went from from like here to here to here to here to here until I wanted to, you know, be a runner. And that was kind of where everything uh, where everything went. You know, I was uh, I was doing triathlon and um, then uh, I took a step back from triathlon and then uh, I went back into it, got totally injured, like, you know, crazy injured. Just they compounded. And um, I had the show-stopping injury in 2011 and then took about, I think, about four years out of running. So four years out of running. Yeah, like, really? You took that much time off? I had no choice. It was the showstopper, you know, the one that just just blows you away. You know, you just can't, you can't come back from that run, that one that just made your whole body go, can't do this anymore. And that was where everything started. Um, I looked for help from physiotherapists and osteopaths and chiropractors back in England. And I just didn't get better. I didn't get the improvement that I was, you know, told I was going to get the improvement that I was expecting. Um, and I went off on my journey on my own to find all the answers. And I found quite a few of them, I think. So uh, it's been it's been that journey that's kind of brought me to where I am now, which is a cool journey for me. It's been one of more of um, one of necessity as opposed to wanting to take the journey. So that was the interesting part for me. That's that's crazy to have a catastrophic injury like that and then take four years off. Were those four years? Did you take those off? Like, did you heal um, early, like in that time and then choose not to run? Or was that entire process just trying to heal and get back to normal? Yeah, that that I tried to, to carry on. Um, you know, there have been injuries on the on the run up to that, on the lead up to that, where you kind of just you shrug it off and go, oh, you know, I'll do a bit of stretching and I'll, you know, oh, OK, it feels all right now. I'll go back out there. And the one the I call it my showstopper. Um, it was, it was in the London triathlon in 2011. It was the 2012 Olympic course. So it was the, the Olympic triathlon course in Hyde Park. I got off the bike and started my run and just, you know, set out at my seven minute mile pace to, you know, running off the bike for anyone who does triathlon, you know, running off the bike is not the easiest thing. Um, you know, you've been tucked up in the bike position for a, for an hour and then you get off and try and unfold yourself into a runner and, you know, you, you get out there and it feels like it feels horrible. And for the first few minutes, you kind of have to build up, build up. So about the one, 
about the one mile mark, you kind of tend to open out more and then you, you get to your race pace. So that was my process. Like everybody else's process, you get off the bike and you go a little bit slower than your race pace. And then eventually you kind of open up. And as soon as I opened up trying to hit that six minute mile pace, I, I, everything cramped up. My, my legs just cramped up. My, my quads cramped on me and I stopped and tried to stretch it out as everybody does, of course. And then, uh, tried to get running again and almost immediately cramped again. And it wasn't the cramp where you kind of, you, you know, you're in pain. It was, it was a cramp where I just, it wasn't working. It just wouldn't work. It was, it was strange. Um, so yeah, tried to stretch it out again and then felt okay again, set out on the run again. Nope. Not having any of it cramped again. And I was like, okay, I'm done. And I sat at the side and just, Clapped everybody else going past me. <laughs> so it was that, okay, I'm done. <laughs> so. You know, that's, that's one of the things that kind of caught my eye first um, was when I saw, I think I found you through maybe someone in a running group. I saw mentioned your name on someone's post. Right. So like, I'll oh, check this guy out. Right. Um, you know, started looking through all your stuff. And that was one of the things that caught my eye was um, your, I think you made a post about stretching or something like that. And, you know, it's kind of like whenever I encounter something like that, I, I, my mind immediately goes to like when germ theory was first produced, where it was just like this wild claim that was kind of just not accepted. And it was just like this, uh, that sounds weird. And it just kind of dismissed. And yeah. then over time, it, that people are like, oh, there might be something to this, actually. So when I saw you post that about stretching, you know, like it, it's counterintuitive to like what I've been taught, you know, and I you know, got a, a personal training certification through NASM, which uh, that's like, like a whole other thing. But like just all the certifications, things I've been taught, things I've done, things I've told other people to do, it was counter to that. So it makes me stop for a second and think, OK, like, am I fucking up somewhere along here? Like, is there something I'm not I'm not seeing? So. Right. I'm curious, like with stretching, what is your view on it and why? So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Everybody, everybody who I talk to always says, well, hold on a second. What do you mean? Don't stretch. So, you know, you're not the first one and you won't be the last. Don't worry. Um, about, I, I was a gymnast when I was a kid. Um, so I started in gymnastics and of course, every gymnast has to stretch, right? Because we're trying to be super flexible for the movements that we've got to do in gymnastics. I was then a dancer as well. So I've got into a lot of dancing and of course, stretch, right? Um, because you're looking for a range of motion that you need to be able to get into for the thing that you're doing. Now, if you think about, um, think about runner, runner doesn't need a huge range of motion. We need a specific range of motion to be able to run effectively. Now, of course, the faster you run, the longer your stride gets, the bigger your range of motion needs to be but that isn't all coming from one place. Um, and something we'll probably touch on later, which is to do with rotation and how you rotate the torso and how you elevate the shoulders and rotate through that movement. It all adds to your stride length. So when people are stretching and they're trying to get this range of motion, it's, it's kind of like, it's not understood. It's not fully understood where this stride length, this air time that we create when we run is coming from. And so people are trying to stretch their hamstrings. And I'm like, the first thing that occurred to me was, why am I trying to stretch my hamstrings? What am I trying to achieve here? So whenever somebody said to me, okay, you're injured, you need to do this, I would straight away, why? And I started questioning everything. So the latest research on stretching is, comes from a place of um, looking at muscles, fascia, and nerves. And why, what do we have stretch reflex mechanisms for if we're just going to, just going to try and stretch everything beyond the stretch reflex point. So if you think of um, how the muscle actually relaxes, gets to a point where it's going to its stretch, the fascia that's, that's surrounding the muscle is already being stretched. So the fascia is the first thing to get stretched. And if the fascia gets stretched for too long or too fast or too many times within a certain space of time, which we, we don't know what that is, but if the fascia is getting stretched too far or too fast or too much, it will 
what we call plastically deform. So it will, it won't go back. Now the fascia is the first thing to stretch. The muscle is stretching way after the fascia stretches. So what you feel when you're doing a hamstring stretch or doing a calf stretch or whatever stretch you're doing is actually the fascia stretching. And we don't want to force that fascia to stretch. The arrangement of fascia is kind of like this. So it's always like this. And then when it gets stretched, it opens out and then pulls back. So it's like this crimped environment that fascia is in. So when we stretch and then we return, the fascia is going back to this situation. Now, the muscle get, starts to stretch after the fascia gets to this full stretch. So you're not stretching muscle before you're stretching fascia. Now, this was research that came out in 2019 from the Fascia Institute. Um, it was, there's a couple of guys, called one called Robert Schlepp, Schlepp I think you pronounce his name, um, and I can't remember the other lady's name, and, but they were the authors on this study. Um, this is through fascial dissections that they've researched this. This is not guesswork. This is actual research showing us now what happens when we stretch ourselves and we stretch our bodies. The human body is designed to resist stretch. That's the crazy thing about it. It's designed to resist stretch and running. The best runners are actually the least flexible because they're the most elastic. They spend less time on the ground. They've got less ground contact time. They're quicker getting off the ground, which is a property of more elastic people, right? So when we hit the ground, we come off the ground much quicker because we're elastic. Now, elasticity and flexibility are opposites. They're at the opposite end of a continuum. So when people who are running, they're going out and doing their run and then they're stretching afterwards, what you're doing is you are, uh, you're actually unadapting to what running is asking you to adapt to. So it's kind of crazy that, you know, we see people going out for a run and then they're like, All right, we must stretch after we run. And I'm like, no, you're undoing all of the good stuff that you did when you ran. Because the adaptation to running is improved elasticity. So if I want to be a better runner, I want improved elasticity. I want everything that running gives me. I don't want to unadapt to those things. And that's the crazy part of it. So when we're, we're, we're running, we want to hit the ground and get off the ground. We want to spend less time on the ground. And if you're a more flexible runner, you're actually going to spend longer on the ground rather than less time on the ground. So it's, That's again, an interesting point because um, that was something I heard. I forget. It was, it was like a world-class power lifter talked about refusing to ever stretch his hamstrings. He's like, when you hit the bottom of the squat, you want that tightness because it pulls you back up. You're like, I never stretch my hamstrings ever. And running, our version of running is, you know, when the foot hits the ground fully and you're going to load and take off the next step, you're hitting, you're stretching it more or less, and it, and it goes that quick reflex. Yeah, you are. You're stretching it. When your foot hits the ground, you've got the arch of the foot. I'm going to create a crude arch of my foot. So here's your calcaneus, your heel bone, and there's the rest of your foot. Very crude. But when it hits the ground, what it does is it goes like that and then it comes back. So I just think of a runner who is suffering with plantar fasciitis, right? They hit the ground and their arch is not responding. Well, why isn't it responding? Well, maybe it's overstretched already. Maybe the amount of times you've hit the ground, it's actually just taken all of that responsiveness out of the plantar fascia. Uh, maybe it's the muscles that are above the plantar fascia. So the tibialis anterior, the tibialis posterior, and the perineals that are not lifting the arch back up again. So why are we why are we trying to stretch something that's already stretched? Like the just the definition of plantar fasciitis, it says it's already stretched. The plantar fascia is already stretched out. That's why it's getting damaged. So don't force it to stretch even more, right? It's it's already stretched out. I, I have this thing of tight versus taut. So if we think of, of the body in opposites at all times, because of the way our body is this structure of, of equal tension all the way around, it has to create equal tension all the way around. Otherwise, it falls over, right? So if we're going to create this equal tension the whole way around to keep us up and keep us balanced and to keep our head on top of us, 
then we have to, if, if we've got tight muscles, we've also got taut muscles. We don't get tight and tight, we get tight and taut. So if the tight muscles are short, that means the taut muscles must be long. Now, it's the taut muscles that are saying, hey, I'm struggling, I can't do this anymore. I'm being pulled on and it pulls, the tight muscles will pull on the taut and then you'll feel this muscle screaming out and saying, hey, I'm struggling here. But what we do is we go and stretch these ones. So we're stretching something that's already stretched. That's the problem. That's one of the problems. So if we're stretching something that's already stretched and already screaming out in pain almost, we're actually making it worse. And what I find with people that, that buy the Runner's Rehab and a Basic 8, my, one of my eBooks, the first one, the first thing I say to them is we have to stop doing the things that are perpetuating the problem. Because if we don't stop doing those, it's like saying to a drug addict, we're going to get you off drugs by giving you drugs. We're just going to keep a little bit going. No, no, no. We have to stop. We have to get rid of those drugs and we have to stop that. We have to stop that behavior. And it is, it's a behavior. I'm addicted to stretching because it gives a dopamine release. That's another thing that research has shown over the last few years is that stretching actually causes a dopamine release. It feels good. I get that question a lot. Why does it feel good? Dopamine. So we keep doing it and it becomes almost a, a, an addiction to something that's just arbitrary. So I go back to the why. What are you stretching for? Well, to get flexibility. For what? For running. But running doesn't need flexibility, masses of flexibility. So why are you doing it? Oh, it feels good. But does drugs feel good? Does that make it good? If we, we get onto this spiral of questioning and it's like, you know, if, if you kind of question everything and you look for the right answer, then you kind of see the logic is very misplaced. And again, like I said, flexibility and elasticity are on a continuum. If you're flexible, you're probably not going to be very elastic. And what do runners need? Elasticity to get off the ground quicker. Yeah, so, you know, kind of yeah. going on that, <laughs> so with um, like mobility work, do you do you do like like myofascial release then? And, and like, what do you recommend for mobility work of general body maintenance? Yeah. So so mobility work. Yes. MFR, myofascial release. Very specific, though. Um, you know, flailing around on a foam roller for 20 seconds, 30 seconds is really not going to achieve anything. And, you know, when I, when I go into gyms locally, I see people just like, whoa, 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 <laughs> miles an hour on a roller, like it's a competition. <clears throat> really, what you want to be doing is you're working with your nervous system, right? You're trying to, you're trying to coax your nervous system to just chill out. You want, you want really, um, really relaxed body to get, a release because when you are using myofascial release remember everything is connected so if you are not relaxing you're not getting the tissues to relax you're not talking to the nervous system so mobility is self myofascial release or even therapy therapist based myofascial release with a with a, a body worker no problem with that at all it's brilliant um, and then taking your body through range of motion, full range of motion via muscle contractions. So what I don't do is I don't force any joint where it doesn't want to go. I use myofascial release to work on um, allowing those tissues to kind of ease out a little bit. It's, it's, like a, it's like a friendly come on, you can do this. Okay, sure, I can. It's got to be friendly. It's got to be nice. You're not, you're not smacking the crap out of it to try and get it to let go because it won't. So myofascial release is very specific. It's very slow. It's quite deep as well. It can be quite deep, but it's not necessarily hard. You're not trying to, you know, smash the crap out of yourself to get it to do that. That's it's kind of like a, um, what people think about it but it isn't it's breath work it's getting to the bottom of your breath to take the tension out of your body to allow the tissues to then relax and then going through a good full range of motion to to basically tell the nervous system that this is what's available at this joint and that's that's what we do with the runner's rehab we work on specific range of motion at specific joints in a specific way you'll hear me say that word specific a lot 
everything is specific. Nothing is arbitrary. It's to do with the gait cycle. So we work on the pelvis situation a lot. We work on internal rotation of the hips a lot. Um, we work on rotation of the torso a lot. And all of these things are adding to the range of motion that our body gives during our gait cycle and then creating mobility in the tissues that we want mobile to allow us to move in the way we want to move. You know, how much time do people spend sitting behind a desk or sitting in a car or just sitting down? Like we're sitting down now. We're adding to our own problems right now. <laughs> you know, so we're, we're, we're just a product of a stiff body, right? Humans are, are a product of a stiff situation, a stiff lifestyle, so taking our body using these self myofascial release techniques and then taking our joints through a specific range of motion in specific ways to create that ability and gait that we need to be a good runner. And it's, it's yeah. looking at it from a perspective of the gait cycle. Yeah, that's, that's um, another thing I found interesting is I, I know a lot of like, you know, general programs and strength training programs and like, you know, runners like you should do this and stuff. What I found interesting about your program was it's very specific. It's very unique. I've never seen anything like it and that it's very specific to the running movement instead of a general, um, you know, do this to strengthen this muscle that will help you in running. So, right. but I am curious too about, um, how you feel about dynamic stretching by way of, like using a full range of motion. So for instance, if, um, if I want to, you know, make sure I get a full range of motion and my hamstrings are mobile doing like a Romanian deadlift where I'm going as far into that movement as I can safely and then returning, how do you feel about like mobilizing your body through that kind of method? I, I don't have a problem with anything that anybody wants to do as far as, you know, if I want to exercise in this way, go for it, go ahead and do it. Um, my, my real issue is when somebody says, do this for this. And I go, okay, is this the thing that you want to do for this? So yeah, you know, doing a Romanian deadlift or, or doing a stiff legged deadlift or, or whatever, they have their place. And I have no problem with that. Why kind of, you know, I question people a lot and say, okay, why are you doing this? And let's figure out exactly what it is that you're doing for the reason that you're doing it. And if those two things fit together, right? Because that's what I find a lot of, for example, um, strength training, right? Strength, as we know, if anybody who's done a strength and conditioning course will know that strength is specific to the movement. So if I want to get stronger, biceps, I have to do elbow flexion or, or I have to do supination of the palm or I have to do shoulder flexion because all of those things are a part of the bicep. So it's specific to the movement. If I don't do that movement, then I'm not going to get stronger within that movement. That's kind of like the basic rule of strength and conditioning is strength is specific to the movement. Then you've got all the little offshoots of that, which is strength is specific to the speed of the movement, to the uh, force uh, to the uh, force vector. So is it vertical or is it horizontal force? Is it rotational force? Um, then you've got the uh, strength endurance continuum. So am I working for power or strength or hypertrophy or endurance? So there's lots of things that strength has to be specific to. So um, we go back to your Romanian deadlift thing. What's, what is a Romanian deadlift movement gonna make, make me stronger in? Romanian deadlifts. That, that's ba the basic premise of it. So then we go to how is that movement made up? So which muscles are coordinating to control the movement of that deadlift? So we've got hip flexion, hip extension, right? The muscles that are having to coordinate are working together. They have to work together in specific ranges of motion at specific times to get that weight off the ground and get you to stand up. Now, is that gonna carry over into running? Maybe a little bit, but probably not that much because when I run, my foot wants to hit the ground as it's being pulled backwards. My torso is always gonna be vertically stacked over my pelvis. I'm never going down and coming up. So is it giving me the correct range of motion in the correct muscle fibers of the hamstrings that are working together with the adductors and the glute at the right time? No. 
because my other leg is also swinging forwards. And then I get, well, I just do it on one leg. I'm like, yeah, but it still doesn't <laughs> work, right? It's yeah, you're 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 going a little bit further into the specificity rule by doing it on one leg. But I'm never leaning forwards and standing back up again when I'm running. Right? I'm always stacking my torso vertical, and there's always one leg going forwards, one leg going backwards. So is a Romanian deadlift going to be specific for running? No, it's not. It's an exercise, and it's a great exercise for Romanian deadlifting. But is it going to be an exercise that's going to carry over to running? Maybe a little bit, but probably not. So, yeah, that's like the classic, um, right? even look at like a bodybuilder who lifts a lot of weights. And it, I feel like it's a classic example that I've seen similar to this, where then you take this person who's done a lot of squats, you know, he could squat, whatever, like very impressive amounts. And then you put yeah. him in a manual labor environment and he has to pick up things in a strange position and right. they have a they struggle to do it as compared yeah. to someone who's been doing that since they were, they were younger, but doesn't weight train because exactly. they, they are not you know, producing that force through the same range of motion that they have right. practiced that strength in, you know. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, then just go with this, this strength thing for a second. Um, and, I, and I'm not against, I'm not anti anything. I'm pro specificity. That's what I'm all about is being pro specificity, being specific for what we want to be specific for, getting a specific outcome. That's what every runner wants to do. They want to get a specific outcome, which is to be better at running. Right. That's what they're running for. So just dealing on this strength training thing for a second. Most of what we will do in strength training is we lift weights and weights only have weight because of gravity. So that makes it a vertical force, a vertical load. Right. So I'm producing a vertical force against a vertical load. And running is predominantly horizontal. Right. When I run a 10K or a 5K or a half marathon or a marathon, it's measured horizontally. It doesn't matter how many squats I do. It doesn't matter how many deadlifts I do, how, many, how long I can hold a plank for. If I don't run, I don't get from the start line to the finish line. Every step I take is a horizontal production of force. And then because of the ankle and foot lever and because of the hip lever i create some vertical oscillation some vertical distortion in my horizontal movement right every runner needs that we have to have it but we only want a certain amount otherwise we get this doing 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 and we get this you know over over vertical uh, uh too much vertical oscillation so strength training should be horizontal not vertical if I'm running and running is a horizontal output and it gives me a horizontal direction of force, I will get to my line, to my finish line faster. That's it. If you just take that as the simplest way, doesn't matter how many squats I do, how many deadlifts I do, how long I hold a plank for. If I don't produce horizontal force, I go nowhere. Right. That is like mind blowing for some people to think of that part and then go, yeah, that's kind of true, right? So well, focus on horizontal movement and you'll get the vertical movement that you need as a result of that horizontal movement because of the levers at our joints, at our ankle joint, our hip joint, you'll get what you need. But you don't need to focus on producing vertical movement to be a better runner. Do you find that like with the people that come to you is almost their entire problem related to not being trained through these specific movements um or are, are there people that um you know maybe it's overuse or something but can you avoid a lot of overuse injuries if you train with this like does it fortify your body to where someone who is doing that training versus isn't doing that training could this one person that's doing the training ramp up much quicker in their mileage yeah they could they can because you're you're, you're able to, to focus your energy in the horizontal plane, which makes it so that you're not only withstanding the horizontal rotational torque forces better, um, you're, you're just not getting that vertical oscillation the whole time. And you're not producing uh, forces that you don't need to produce. You know, I, I have this thing about, um, are you training or are you just arbitrarily 
exhausting yourself, right? Training is specific, exercise isn't. So anybody can exercise. I could do 20 push-ups now and, you know, do some sprints. That would, do, that would be exercise because it's getting my heart rate up. But is it specific? No, not really. So somebody who trains horizontally, who starts to do more horizontal movement, you'll stop doing so much vertical-based movement and you'll change the, the, the way that your body is dealing with those forces. So, yeah, I, I generally find that, you know, when people start doing horizontal-based movement, rotational-based movement, sometimes people take a little bit longer to come around to the idea. And part of what I did with the sling method is create something that can replace most other things. That was one of my goals. Well, if I'm saying don't do this, I have to have something to replace it with because <laughs> you know, a lot of runners are kind of addicted to running and training and exercising. So first thing is to get them to see, you know, the logic of what I'm saying and then to get them to kind of like gradually come over to this way and then to replace what they're doing with something that's going to be more productive for running. Um, you know, I tend to find that when people really commit to it, they're getting at the, they have the ability to do more much quicker and they generally, um, they, don't, they don't get injured in the same way. They don't get injured as much. And because of how they're now thinking, it's not a question of, I need to do more because I'm too weak. It's, I need to find where the problem is. I need to look at my running, look at my gait, and I need to see what it is that's causing the problem. And it might be the same thing that they had before that they kind of took their eye off the ball a little bit and then started ramping up their mileage and didn't pay attention to it. Um, and it might be something different because when you change how you move, you change where the force goes to. So, you know, once you change your way of thinking on these things, you're going to, you, you're not going to just start strength training everything or you're not going to see the answer to everything is just get stronger because it isn't. Right. I, I see seven year olds that run faster than 30 year olds and 40 year olds. I see 10 year olds that are, you know, running half marathons in an hour 40, but they're not strong. They're not weightlifting every other day. They can't squat 300 pounds. So how can they run that fast? So it's the answer is not strength. The answer is specific strength and specific movement. Once you kind of get down that route, you start going for specific strength, specific movement, specific mobility with specific forces in a specific time. And you, you start to get that word specific coming into everything. Um, so, yeah, I, I do see that people do tend to be um, just able to see where they're going wrong much more easily because then they're not thinking about things that aren't relevant as a runner. And are the exercises that you design for your program, are those really just a vehicle to improve gait or are they in and of themselves doing some kind of specific strengthening or is the end goal just to get to a better gait? It's, it's all of it. It's all of it. And, you know, it, strength training is, is brilliant, right? I love strength training because I like being strong. Um, but I want to be strong for the right thing, not the wrong thing. Um, I, I could go down the route of saying that our bodies adapt to certain forces in certain places, right? That, that's true. So I want my body to adapt to the right force in the right place so that it's not adapting to the wrong force in the wrong place. So, and that goes back to your mobility question. If I'm training my body to do a movement better, I'm untraining my body to do a different movement better. If I'm training my body to do uh, a, a specific movement that then creates a line of stress in the body, the body's going to adapt to that. And then I'm going to potentially have to work around that to get the movement I want. Right. So if I'm stuck in an external rotation, like I my, say, for example, my feet point out because I've adapted to doing squats with feet pointing out. Right. Well, in running, I want to have my feet straight and I actually want to internally rotate as I go, as my leg goes backwards. I don't want my leg to be flicking out as it comes off the ground, which is one of the things that kind of external rotation movements will force you to do. 
Um, so, you know, I, I want to kind of get that movement into my body, the internal rotation movement. So I want to work on those things. I want to get better at doing those things. I don't know whether that answers the question. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to make sure I answer the question as well as, uh, as well as give the, you know, the, the environment that I find a lot of runners in so that people can kind of relate to this. Um, yeah, it is. I, I feel like, um, I feel like a lot of people, they see the path to getting to where they want to be much, much more easily, if that makes sense. Once they've kind of like put the blinkers on to what they want and they see that the things that they're, that we do with the exercises that we do, they're making the strength of the movement that they want better. There you go. That's better. That, that makes more sense now, doesn't it? If the exercises that we're doing are strengthening the right movements, then moving in that way becomes easier. There we go. That's a better way to explain it, I think. <laughs> I kind of went round a little roundabout way there. Um, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because that's, yeah. that's what I was really curious about was just in terms of like how that's facilitating a better gait. Cause I know from myself, like my, my last two injuries have all been related to gait. They were like, I got, you know, towards late in the race, I was so tired, the form breaks down. I start doing a kind of a, sh a shuffling thing. And then that led to a stress fracture. And then, um, and then I had like a runner's knee issue which was related to me playing with like my times a little bit and I actually started running slower than I normally do. And what, and I went from running like pretty fast, but not like all out for a lot of runs, but I started slowing down, you know, cause I had done a little bit more research on stuff. And when I yeah. started slowing down within a couple of weeks, I started getting knee problems. So right. to me, that was something like my gait was breaking down. I wasn't keeping the proper form as I slowed down. Right. Yeah. The, so that when, when we when we're moving through our gait cycle there's a certain movement that that we ideally want to produce every time in order to produce a good gait cycle every time right so if you're training to produce those movements which is what the exercises in the sling method do then you're going to be better at producing those movements for longer because you're training them in that environment you're training your body to move that way um part of I've been posting on the Revolutionize Your Running page, um, the, the public Facebook group that I have. I've been posting recently on there to try and get a specific point across to people, which is about how you strike the ground. Now, we know that it's impossible to strike the ground underneath your center of mass or underneath your hip. That research goes back 20 years. It needs to be put out there every week so that we're, you know, people are kind of understanding that we land in front of us. Now, what we want to make sure when we're landing is that we're actually landing with the leg being pulled backwards. That's what we want to make sure. Now, if you watch every professional runner, doesn't matter who you watch, just get a slow-mo video of any professional runner, you will see that they all hit the ground with their leg being pulled backwards. Now, if you go to your local park and you watch a load of you know, amateur runners running, you'll see people going jabbing into the ground, right? Now that is the problem. That's the problem. If the leg is, if the leg is swinging and then it hits the ground as it's traveling forwards, that's where all your braking forces are. Okay. Now if I, if I swing the leg and then in midair, I start to then swing it backwards and it hits the ground as it's coming backwards, it's just going to catapult me over the top. I'm going to get this, this, clinging action over the top of my, of my leg because I'm pulling my leg backwards. Then it hits the ground and it throws me over the top. Right. And that is the movement that we want to get. That's the movement that we want to get. That's the key movement. And it doesn't come from just the leg. It comes from the torso rotation. It comes from the shoulder dropping and elevating. It comes from this circular movement. Now, what, what we do in the swing method is we work to produce and to kind of make these movements uh, ingrained. We're training that movement so that when you go out and run, you get that movement. And the more you train it, 
the more it becomes a pattern in your in your brain, in your body, in your nervous system. And it doesn't matter what speed you're running at, that movement always occurs. It's just on repeat the whole time. And when you start to try and run faster, you don't just stride out and start hitting the ground when your legs are going forwards. What you do is you, you basically just lengthen your stride, but the same action occurs. So you're just creating bigger airtime. Now, of course, that costs you more energy, but then you get the ground reaction forces when you hit the ground, which give you some energy back, which we know, right? But that movement is the key movement. So if you get that movement and you ingrain that pattern, you'll get that at any speed. So it doesn't matter whether you're running a 15 minute mile pace or a 12 minute mile or a 10 minute mile or an eight or a six, that's the same movement with more force to go faster and a longer stride. Cadence is kind of like, yeah, don't worry about that. Just, just don't worry about it. Obviously the faster you run, the faster your cadence will be. So don't worry about cadence. Too many people worry about cadence. They're like, oh, it was a 175 or it was a 183. Who cares? Just run. As long as you get that movement right, the faster you run, the faster your cadence will gradually be with a longer stride as well. So the two kind of go hand in hand. But that movement is the key movement. So if you get that movement ingrained in you, you'll just be able to pick up your pace and keep the same movement. It negates a lot of ground reaction force. It, it, you're not landing hard, you're landing and you're slinging yourself over the top. And that's the key. So if, I, right. if, if anybody takes something away from this, it's that that movement is key. That makes right. a lot of sense. You know, when you think of that, I mean, the sling method does make sense. And the fact you're like this kind of pro almost propelling your body in this smooth, perpetual manner. Yeah. And yeah. something you mentioned that, that I want to get to too is the rotation. So yeah. like I had it, you know, fairly drilled into me just from the information I was given is don't let your, you know, arms cross the midline of your body and mm -hmm. generally keep rotation down and kind of move your arms almost like you're um, sawing a log. You know what I mean? Where you're, you're just going just kind of straight like that. That's um, what I was taught. Yeah. And so that's just kind of what I did because like, you know, I was just like, I, I haven't heard a reason why I shouldn't. So like, <laughs> I'm very curious now after going through all this, what, how do you feel about that? And why should I not do that per se? Okay. Take a, take a little slow-mo uh, slow -mo video of any professional runner. We're talking about endurance gait here, not necessarily sprint gait because they're a little bit different. Sprinting and endurance gait are a little bit different. So as an endurance runner, just go and watch any slow-mo video of any elite level or pro level or, or even just a really good club runner. You'll see them rotate their torso. You'll see their shoulders go in front. If I, if I kind of like go back a little bit, you'll see this. You'll see this movement happening. You'll see their hand crossing the midline of their body. However, if you turn to the side, now you can see my shoulders are straight, but they're actually not. They're rotated relative to my body. Does that make sense? Their hand coming roughly to their midline. They're not crossing. But when you look at it like here, you can see that my hand has crossed my midline this way. But when I turn, it hasn't crossed my torso midline. It's all relative. Okay? It's all relative. So when you're... When you watch those slow-mo videos, and if you go to my Revolutionize Your Running page on, on Facebook, you'll see that. And I've actually done a YouTube video um, of uh, a couple of runners. I can't remember who they are off the top of my head, showing that running is rotation. Every joint must rotate, okay? Our knees rotate, our ankles rotate, our hips rotate, our spine rotates, our shoulders rotate, everything rotates. So don't take the rotation away because this horizontal force that we, that we produce is a rotational force. So if every joint is supposed to rotate in gait, which is a rotational movement, if you take any of those rotational movements away, you're going to send most of that force to the joint that rotates the least, which is the knee. Oh, okay. And, right? Interesting so, said because I, you know, ran always straight <laughs> back and forth like that. And if there's one body part I have the most problems with and have for most of my life, it has been my knee. Right. Right. The knee rotates. 
when it's on the ground, when the foot's on the ground, we treat we treat the leg as one piece. It's almost like a pogo stick, not not in an up and down way, but it's almost like one piece. Now, when it's off the ground, the knee bends. So we treat it as two pieces because they're actually rotating. The locking mechanism in the knee is a rotational mechanism. I know you know this. Other people probably don't. Um, so the, the knee must rotate when it's off the ground. When it's off the ground, it's bending and then it's straightening or almost straightening. But when the foot is on the ground, we want to treat that entire leg cylinder, I call them cylinders, as one piece. And it wants to be gripped inwards to the midline, to the midline of the body. So that as the foot is on the ground and the leg is being pulled back, the pelvis swings over the top like a, like a door on a hinge almost. So if the pelvis is on top of the femur, on top of that femur, and it just swings over the top, the leg has to be one piece. It has to create tension. The muscles create the tension all the way down. The adductors, the hamstrings, the two innermost hamstrings, semitendinosus, semimembranosus. We've got the knee rotators. They internally rotate to create stability at the knee. All your external hip rotators are actually not they're not doing anything. They're, they're just there waiting for their moment to work. And it isn't when the foot's on the ground. If we externally rotate the hip when the foot's on the ground, it turns outwards. What we're doing is we're creating this collapsing situation, right? If I turn my, leg, my hip out, if I turn my entire leg outwards, I create a collapsing situation for the pelvis. If it stays gripped inwards at the midline, and then the pelvis swings over the top, I've got this beautiful fluid rotational movement that you see every elite runner doing. So the adductors have to be super powerful. In fact, the adductors have to over, almost override the glute when the foot is on the ground. The glute really controls the torso. It stops the torso from falling forwards. So the glute is really not shouldn't be treated as a as an extension hip extension muscle in gait um, it, it should be relatively quiet when the foot is on the ground relatively quiet shouldn't be this massive driver because it's such a huge external rotator and we don't want that when we run why would i want my foot on the ground so then all of a sudden turn outwards why would i want my femur to turn outwards when i'm on the ground i'd be i'd be running around in circles on the spot if that was the case it doesn't work that way. So I want this rotation. I don't want this. I don't want this, right? I want this rotation and I want relatively quiet arms. I want these to be held close to the torso so that they create minimal torque, right? Try, try and hold your arms out for an hour. See how hard that is, right? These levers are really, they're, they're, they're very inefficient. So if I have my arms really close to my body, they don't, they don't create any torque. So if I keep them really close, I'm not, they're not getting involved as much. If you watch the African and Ethiopian fe uh, female, female runners, the women runners, see how high they hold their arms. They're using all of this. One of the drills in the, the, the basic eight in the sling method is actually called the crossed arms runner. And it's to get you used to using your torso. It's Really cool because it takes your arms out of the equation. It, it gets you to, to bring the arms really close to the body, which is what we want. I see that as a, a, as a, a running error quite a lot with people. Um, they'll, they'll be you know, running with their arms, their elbows out here and doing all these funky movements with their elbows. And the first thing I say is get those arms in, quieten them down, and they won't generate any torque because they can't because you have to have a lever to generate torque. So if my arms are close to my body, there's no leverage. So they're not adding to the mix. They're not making it more difficult to run. So take them out of the equation. That's what you want to do, rotate. So if we go, think of running and swimming. Running, the actual gait cycle of running is actually like a backstroke swimmer. It's like a backstroke swimmer. Sounds ridiculous, but it really is. If you watch the movement, I'm actually dropping my shoulder as it comes forwards and then elevating it as it goes backwards, forwards down, backwards up. And that's exactly the same as you would do in a backstroke swimmer. So backstroke swimming and running gait are actually very closely related. 
the movement pattern. It's very closely related, which is kind of cool. When you start yeah. seeing these associations, it's really cool. You know, how you explain it to it makes so much sense to me. And it, it'll just, it's, you know, that's why, you know, again, like back to germ theory, it's just like, I believe things just because, you know, there's someone who like, you know, I, I looked at someone who's more experienced at running. And it's a classic thing of, you know, what I found out after I got my certification through NASA, which is a great certification, is after I got it and I took the test and, you know, got all that done. And after I took the test, I was like, you know, and read the book, it, it just in my mind, I was like, I've learned five times more off of YouTube and being interested in reading articles and doing my own research on stuff. And then it kind of opened my eyes to, you know, people in these like positions of authority, even like a trainer that you assume is really well educated. There's so much that they don't have information to. So if they're not actively seeking this out, they're never going to get it. So, but since I didn't know much about running, I would look to people that are kind of in that similar thing where they knew things, but um, they weren't super well versed in, you know, just kind of the full aspect of it. And you, it's kind of fall into that. Well, they know more than me and you just kind of do whatever they do without questioning it. Yeah. So that's why uh, I think when you come along and explain something like this, I, I just think it's almost like undeniable that, you know, that this makes more sense to me at least. So, you know, with this whole program, I, I don't know, I think it's fantastic just like from everything I've seen. And it's really interesting. I'm curious, like now that you've used this program and stuff, like how's your, um, like what's your participation in endurance events? Like, do you do any, any more? I don't, I haven't, I haven't raced for a long time. Um, I, I'm so like wrapped up in this process and so wrapped up in what I'm doing. I've kind of, I, I still, I run, I still run now and I'm pain free. And that I, I was in pain so much. I would not just when I ran, but every day, my pain levels, you know, I put my back out just, just reaching down for something. I'd be in pain for like six days. And, you know, I was super strong. I was, uh, you know, I, I could squat silly amounts. I could deadlift silly amounts. I could hold a plank for 20 minutes. I was a gymnast. I was a power lifter. I bodybuilded for a while. You know, I'd done all of that stuff. I run now pain-free pain-free a lot which is much more than i think most runners can say yeah yeah i'm pain-free every day i haven't had pain years now years and that that was got through going through this process and just kind of realizing that what i was doing was not for my body. It wasn't what a human body needed to do. You know, I, I've done my uh, NASM CPT, my uh, corrective exercise specialist, performance enhancement specialist. I've done all of my manual therapist courses, certifications, I've done all of those things. I've got my kettlebell certifications. I taught Pilates for 15 years. I've, I've done those things to know how they treated my body. I know stretching. I was a gymnast and a dancer. I've done all of this stuff and it, I was still in pain, huge amounts of pain. I was taking pain pills for quite a while. Could have been bad, could have ended up really bad. But I chose to, to say, you know what, I'm not doing that. I'm going to go a different way. And I, I, I don't do my own product every day. What I do is I have bits of it that I apply to my everyday life. So I'm not spending all my time in this studio, you know, doing all of my rotational movements. What I do is I apply it to my all day, every day life. So just being aware of what my body does and how it moves has enabled me to change what my body does and how it moves. Just being aware of standing with my feet turning out. Now I don't have that anymore. You know, I stand with my feet straight and I don't force it anymore because through my fascial release, and through retensioning of my hips and my pelvis, I now stand well. I stand with, with great postural situation, with great postural positioning, which allows me to move better. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I, I do my product. I do it four, five, four times a week. But it, I made a point to myself for it not to become my obsession. I, I wanted to be... Uh, ongoing 
product of my product, if that makes sense. You know, I want to be showing what I can do, but not showing something that's not able to be done by everybody. You know, if I if I have to do this twice a day, every day, seven days a week, that's not attainable by everybody, right? Whereas 20 minutes a day is totally attainable by most people, right? If it's 45 minutes three times a week and then 20 minutes every other day, that's totally attainable. So I wanted to make it something that was totally available, attainable, achievable, doable, followable by anybody. And that's that's kind of where I went with it. So, yeah, just, you know, getting my body to that point. It took work because I was I was really down the rabbit hole um, and reversing that and putting it to where it is now. It took time. But I've streamlined that process now so much. And I, I've kind of that's what the reason why I'm now on the fifth version, the fifth edit of the, of the runners rehab and the basic eight is because the first one and the second one and the third one and the fourth one, I just learned more. I learned so much more. And now I'm doing the fifth one. I think this one's probably going to be, I reckon it's going to be 10 years proof. So I don't think it's going to need to change for, for 10 years now. Cause I don't think the research is going to change in the next 10 years from what we've got now. I think it's got to a point where we know enough uh, if you're following it. And if you're paying attention to it, we know enough to be able to go, okay, this is what we need to do. And I, I firmly believe that the sling method is a working model of all of that research for runners for endurance runners. So yeah, I, I, I can certainly see it. Um, you know, we're getting instructors in all different countries now taking the level one and level two. So it's, it's going to grow now. It's just going to get bigger and bigger. And I, I know that it's helping so many people. I see it every day and I, I hear comments and, re- and uh, emails from people every day going, my God, I can't believe I, why did I wait so long to do this? That's the one that gets me the most. You know, I was on the fence for so long and, okay, I finally pulled the plug, pulled, pulled the trigger and, and now I'm three months later, I'm so much better than I ever was. And they've stopped doing things. That's been the key, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. Like eliminating a lot of behaviors in addition to, you know, adding to them. And I'm yeah. curious, yeah. like, you know, I've done my fair share of stretching, but as someone who's been a gymnast and done your fair share plus three other people's of stretching <laughs> so like to repair yourself do you does, yeah. is there a, like do you actually kind of regain some of that elasticity like kind of letting your body retighten to a more natural state like can you get that back at all okay i'm gonna i'm gonna go a bit opinionated here and i apologize for doing that um and i'm and the reason why i'm saying this because I, is because i've done it um the, the a lot of the research says that once something is plastically deformed now if you want to look up that on just do a google search for plastic deformation what that basically says is every material once it gets to a certain point of 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 stressing it it won't go back so if you think of something like a uh, a pencil if you start trying to snap a pencil and you don't go far enough it'll just go straight back to being a pencil if you go too far it snaps and there's no going back. So if you think of a of a steel bar, you're trying to trying to trying to you know bend it and it won't bend. But if you if you do create enough force to bend it, now it's bent and it ain't going back unless you apply the same force going back the other way. Okay. Now with us, with our bodies, with human bodies, we're fascia. We're we're uh, fascia is a. Uh, a living entity it's an entity that is liquid and it changes it changes its its uh, form so when we warm up our bodies our fascia becomes more liquid it becomes it's like engine oil in a car it becomes more viscous so it becomes more more fluid like rather than being thick it, it starts to get really thin and it starts to, it allows you to move much more freely. 
Now, fascia, fascia forms along lines of tension. So it thickens along lines of tension. Now, when you've been stretching, you've been creating a stress which has damaged the fascia, potentially damaged the fascia. Now, if you create a line of stress along that fascia where it's been damaged, I believe that it can change. That's what I've done. I think that's pretty cool because I stretched the absolute crap out of my body. <laughs> so, and, and I'm not going to sit here and say I'm perfect because I'm not. I, I, you know, I go and run and I run, you know, six miles at an eight minute mile pace. And, you know, I come back from my run and I'm kind of like, Oof, that was, yeah, that was a run. You know, I feel it. I, it's not that I don't feel anything. I get back off my run and I'm like, oh, that was hard work or, oh, I really felt that one. Or, oh, my, I, can, I can feel my body working, but it's not hurt. It's not injured. It's not damaged anymore, right? And, and I believe that's through putting the right force in the right place through the right movements that I've changed the way or the, 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 the I've changed the way that my body is now uh, laid the fascial thicknesses and that it's created new fascial thicknesses that's adapted to what I'm doing now and unadapted to what I did before because it's always adapting, it's always changing. And if it's always adapting and always changing, I, I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe and I hope that there's an amount of stress that you can put on a, a body part that will then force it to adapt and become what it should be again. Maybe not perfect, maybe not 100% perfect, but I believe it can adapt. I'm glad to hear that because I've done a good amount of stretching in my day but <laughs> but if you can get to a point where you're running you know pain-free I think almost anybody that's kind of the beauty in your story which I think is kind of, honestly kind of the cool part where like some of the worst moments of your life turn around yeah. eventually and come full circle where it's like yeah. you needed to be the person who stretched himself out as much as he could and just completely shattered your entire body more or less to get to the point where you can actually make a difference and help a bunch of people you know and I, and I absolutely, I stretched the crap out of my body. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, think, imagine being a gymnast and a dancer, right? And going to a physiotherapist or a physical therapist for people in the US. And your, your PT says to you, okay, I want you to stretch. And you say, but I was a gymnast and I'm really flexible. And they go, well, you need to stretch more. And you go, <laughs> uh, Okay, sure. I'll go and stretch more. They, How do you want me to stretch? And they go, well, you need to stretch your hamstrings and your calves and you need to stretch this and stretch this. And you go, I can't stretch it any more than it is. I can already get my head to the ground. You know, I can get my head between my knees in a, in a, in a hamstring stretch, you know. Um, I, I Like, how can I stretch any more? That was the problem. And that was, for me, that was my point where I started to question. I'm like, I can't get any stronger. I'm a power lifter. I can't get any stronger. I'm a gymnast. I can't, how strong do you want my core to be? I can already hold a plank for 20 minutes, right? How, where can I go from where I already am that's going to make me not injured? How much strength is enough strength? How much flexibility is enough flexibility? How much core strength is enough core strength? And when I didn't get answers to those questions, because it's, it's like how long's a piece of string, right? How strong do I have to be to not be injured? <laughs> how, how can you answer that question, right? So, so I, when I didn't get answers to those questions, I started thinking a little bit differently. And I started looking at, at, at the body differently rather than saying, you know, I need to be more flexible. I started to say, can you define flexibility for me? And then rather than saying, well, you need to be stronger. I said, can you define strength for me? I started to think differently. 
And that was the big change for me was when I when I started to just throw out a simple to me, it sounded like a simple question. You're telling me I need to get stronger. I'm asking how strong do I need to be? Why is that a difficult answer? So when I didn't get the answer that I thought I was going to get or I hoped I was going to get, I started to go, well, OK, well, no, I'm not doing that. No, no, maybe that's wrong. And that's where my whole trajectory changed. I started thinking less of somebody, uh, less of less of me being somebody who needs to squat more, deadlift more, plank more and be more flexible. Rather than thinking like that, I started to think of I need to be better at producing my gait cycle. So I need to look at gait models. I need to look at gait biomechanics. And when I started doing that, I realized where I was going wrong. I, it, it was like blatantly obvious where I was going wrong. My gait sucked. I was fast, but I was injured and I was in pain. And when I admitted that to myself, that actually I'm, I'm in a lot of pain. This isn't fun anymore. I don't want to be in pain. You know, I'd rather run an eight minute mile or a seven minute mile than a six minute mile in pain. And that that was what, you know, got me to, to change my trajectory of how I thought. And when I did that, it all changed, of course, because I made a change. It had to change. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every action, you know, equal opposite reaction. But, um, you know, kind of going along with those things, too, I guess. Um, I do have kind of like one last question. I'm curious to what is the single most impactful moment of your life or experience? You know, it doesn't have to be fitness or anything related. Wow. Um, pain. I think pain just for me, you know, I, I, I don't generally tell many people I was actually a trader in, in the city of London. Uh, I worked for JP Morgan. I was a trader on a uh, stock market trader um stress a lot of stress and i i one day i just i quit i literally walked out i typed up my resignation letter i hit print and i told my boss that there's a letter on the printer for you it's my resignation and i'm done and i walked out and i just decided i had enough of the stress um that changed my life that changed everything. I'd never be where I am now if I hadn't have quit that job and decided to literally walk away from the city, walk away from that, that life. Um, you know, it was paid good money and suffered a lot of stress. I wouldn't change what I'm doing now for all of that again, all of that money again. I wouldn't do it. You know, it's just, just kind of putting myself first in my my life my needs my just my my health really um taking away that stress i think was the biggest change to my life um that and that race in 2011 where i where i didn't finish <laughs> that was my first race that i didn't finish and yeah that, those, those two I, I i don't know whether i can uh, i don't know whether i can choose between those two because one got me to change trajectory and then the next one got me to figure out my life, you know, my injuries and my, my future from there. So, yeah, I, I don't know. One of those two, I'll let you choose. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, that is the amazing thing, which I think is partly why, you know, the endurance athletes all kind of recognize this, that as much as pain sucks to experience, it is, the most powerful teacher and, and it actually can be the most positive force in anyone's life. And yeah. just, you know, it's, it was just really interesting to hear your whole story and then how you created the program. Um, and I just want to thank you too, for coming on my podcast. This hey, has welcome. been fantastic to just learn your entire program. And I want to share this with as many people as I can, like as many runners as I know and stuff. Cause I think you can really start changing the way people think about, how they're participating in their running and their training. Um, so thank you very much. And do you have, okay. you know, feel free to say anything, you know, you want at the end and then plug whatever you have going on. Yeah. Just, you know, be your own advocate, be your own best therapist, be your own best advocate. If something isn't working, question it. Um, don't just, just because, and I, I truly respect doctors and surgeons and physical therapists. I, I respect them 
But I, I also want you to respect yourself. I want you to know that if something isn't working for you and you really have tried, because if somebody gives you something and you don't try it, don't say it didn't work because you didn't try it, right? But if you really have tried and you've put your all into it and you can then stand up and go, you know, I tried and this didn't work, then be your best advocate, right? Because what you're doing there is you're learning. You're saying, I tried it and it didn't work. Change what you're doing. Change is the biggest thing that gets you to move forwards in whatever you're doing. If you don't change, you don't get a change. Um, stop doing the things that are not helping you. So crap diets, gone get rid of them Just get you know start working on your diet and nutrition it doesn't have to be perfect but again it needs to improve from where you are maybe um your stress levels try and take 10 deep breaths in and out three times a day i don't know fit something into your schedule twice a day once a day three times a day whatever you can um get that stress level down and if you're trying to be a runner who is not injured and you are currently injured then you have to think of yourself as a runner. You need to think of what your body as a runner needs. It's not your body as a bodybuilder. Your body is a power lifter. Your running doesn't care how strong you are. It doesn't care how long you can hold a plank, how much you can squat. It's not relevant. What it cares about is how well you move in your gait cycle. That's what it cares about. So you need, a, you need something that takes care of your gait cycle and your body in the gait cycle. That is the sling method. And that's the reason why I created it. So if, if you are a runner who is injured, or even if you just want to be a better runner, doing things that are going to help you run better, they're going to improve your running economy, you're, they're going to allow you to run more, run better, run pain-free, run injury-free, that's going to get you more, it's going to get you better. So look into the Sling Method. Uh, the website is theslingmethod.com. Can't get more simple than that. Uh, revolutionize your running with a Z. Uh, revolutionize your running the sling method fix your injuries that's the facebook group that's the public group anybody can join anybody can come along and just see what i'm saying if you want to come and see what i'm saying it's all thought-provoking stuff that's going to get you thinking a little bit differently uh, and it might get you to just stop doing the thing that's causing you to still be injured and that's really key um and then uh, yeah just all the socials you know uh, instagram it's uh, the running by the running mechanic on instagram um and that's it I, I don't really post much to instagram most of my stuff is on facebook so i'm not all over all the different you know mediums i'm just i, I try and focus more on facebook you're always going to get my attention on facebook so um so yeah come and be a part of it and uh, you know say hi and join in that's it right yeah, that's awesome. I'll have um, links to all your stuff to the, the show notes if anyone wants to see it. But yeah. yeah, I guess that is a wrap. Thank you for listening to the Sarsi Fitness Podcast. If you liked it, please share it with your friends, subscribe. Uh, if you could leave a review, that would be fantastic. It helps my channel grow. So I'll be coming out with more episodes in the future. Um, yeah, and I hope you all have a great week.